welcome to theupstreamlife.com. I'm your host and founder, Vishal Krishna. Investing in commercial real estate in India has never been easy for ordinary individuals. Only the extremely wealthy have access to real estate assets in their wealth management portfolio. Other individuals invest in FD and gold, which don't offer great returns and savings. Now imagine investing in commercial real estate like a mutual fund or a stock. It is possible today. Imagine owning multiple commercial real estate portfolios with a fraction of your investable money with a return of 16% in three years. Talking about this is Sesh Rao Paplikar, co-founder and CEO of BI Alts and BI Workspace. Sesh talks about his life of being an entrepreneur and how we scaled Beehive. Beehive has 17 centers with 9 lakh square feet of space and 22,000 plus seats. We are catching up with Sesh at Beehive HSR, which is India's largest co-working campus. Sesh, how are you? Doing well, awesome. No, it's always great to catch up with somebody who takes such good care of the startup ecosystem. And I've been tracking you for a while. I've tracked your evolution from just being a co-working space to you know, getting you know, real estate democratized for investments, alternative investments for people like me. Yes, yes. <laughs> we'll get to that journey. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about you in the early days. You grew up in Karnataka. Yes. How did business happen to you? Are you from a first generation business family or? Uh... Absolutely no. So my, talk about that please. See both my parents were in education. Uh, my father wa used to work in Mysore University. My mother was a lecturer with the government of Karnataka. So absolutely like no business background. I think even today my parents, I think they don't really understand exactly what I do. You know, and uh, my mom used to always tell me, don't open second center, right? Actually, I've opened 17 centers, she gets like shocked. She's like, now you don't even tell me when you open, you know? So it's a very different background, but I think I've always been somebody who used to read the, you know, newspapers uh, from very young age, you know? My, in fact, my, I know that my, my in, at my home, my parents used to read a lot. So there used to be always one English uh, newspaper, one Canada newspaper, then magazines. So uh, somewhere I feel I picked up a lot from those business sections, etc. And people like Dhiruva Imani became my role model. Like even though they were not role models of my father or something, I think I picked it up from there. And, and I think I realized that I was most inspired in my life by entrepreneurs. And, and somehow it just like I had to become an entrepreneur. You know, you mentioned reading, which is a very important thing for kids to do. And yes. I'm glad you said you read and reading inspired you to take up business. Mm -hmm. Parents thought history, is it? What did they teach? Um, my father was a translator, so he was both English, Canada, and administration, etc. My mother was a biology lecturer. Okay. And, and when you entered the world of work, you know, after you went to NIT, of course, you entered the world of work, but again, not coming from a business background, you'd been pretty confused as to what should I do in my life, right? Quickly, can you tell us how did that transformation happen? You were also abroad for a while. Yes, absolutely. So, so what happens is, you know, uh, one thing is I was definitely good at studies. Uh, um, you know, at least whenever I knew that my aptitude is high, I always knew that I was never big into studies. But whenever it mattered, like 10, 12, all the years that mattered, I really like scored like, you know, top my school, etc. Uh, so I had a very, very different, you know, like 8th and 9th, I won't even be top 15 in the school, like 10th, I'll be like the number one. Right, so so I, I knew because I was very confident on my aptitude, etc. It's like I know that like I have the IQ, right? Um, then I ended up going to NITK Suratkal, which is the number one engineering college of uh, Karnataka, and I did computers. I had really nice classmates, some of them you know, um, and uh, I would say you know I, when I passed out in 2003. Definitely entrepreneurship was not at all sexy in that sense. Today when I go to my college, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship cell. You know what, believe it or not, I started my first company when I was in my eighth semester. Nobody, none of the other guys who are today very big entrepreneurs were actually, they were all like sitting and studying at that time. So I was the only guy, a lot of people say, you inspired us. So I, because I was so inspired by Dhiruva Ambani, etc. And also, I think somewhere I realized that my aptitude is good, but being an engineer was not my thing. You know, I'm, I think uh, I have a personality where I need to go out and meet people, like what you do, bring out stories, uh, you know, just because the aptitude is good, I don't think you, one can become an engineer because the personality was not necessarily suitable. So, so my, you know, what happened is my venture failed, whatever I did in eighth semester, I lost some money. What was that company? Um, so basically, I took up the dealership of Reliance. It was not really startup in that sense. Reliance was launching this mobile phone. Yeah, I agree. And back 20 years ago, not many people realized starting up would mean being a trader. We do yeah. trading businesses. 
Yes, yes. So it was not. It was about see, just get getting into business itself a big deal, right? I hired employees. I took a place, you know. So I was studying, of course, in Mangalore, uh, Suratkal. Um, then I I was doing up and down to Mysore, and I was like running my business. Had employees. I saw all the up and down. You know, I ran out of money. I had to let go of people. I saw everything. I I really went. Did you me. borrow money? I borrowed money from my <laughs> uncle and aunt, <laughs> and I lost the money. And I but trust me, I actually paid back. I actually Good paid back. Uh, so basically, I took up a job eventually. I, I kind of that was the backup plan for me because I already had a campus placement, buying a top school, right? Um, so I kind of got back to job. So I think confused means yes. I think one thing I can tell today when I meet people, I know that the ones who come from business background, they are actually can possibly become entrepreneurs in twenties, like early twenties also, because I think somewhere they are prepared for it. But Absolutely. you know, somebody like me. Uh, you know, maybe even you. I, I would think probably we have similar backgrounds. For us, it becomes tough to become an entrepreneur at twenties. You know, uh, we need to really get explore. a bit of a we explore. We need to go explore, which yeah. is what you did. You you were abroad for a while. You worked in a company uh, that was, I think, it was a U.S. company. I think. Yes, I worked for uh, you know, uh, Citigroup, Bank of America, Bloomberg, etc. I was actually in Wall Street. Um, and I, in a way, I'm very glad that maybe it was good that in 20s I worked in corporate life because I got to enjoy my life. In in a way, when I say enjoy, I got a lot of exposure. Uh, going and living in US was not just about career for me personally, also right. The first time I saw life in my money, uh, you know, I, 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 money in my life. Sorry, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, I bought a camera, I bought a laptop. I you know, my parents were never really big in money in that sense. Honestly, they were more into education. I agree um, with you. I mean, that's something that I want to delve with you. I mean, in our generation, I mean, people who are in the late 30s and early 40s, or even older than that, money was always considered a bad thing in our country. Uh, you you had to have knowledge. You can get paid for that knowledge, but you cannot talk about money yeah. in the beginning. We'll get into that. So I'm glad you said going abroad, going to the US, working in Wall Street changed you. You came back mm -hmm. and you started setting up Beehive. Yes. I would say that it was the worst time to start <laughs> because real estate in India was struggling uh, with with policy changes, rare hours coming in, and you got into co-working. Can you talk about the genesis of why you became an entrepreneur now? You did America change you? Did you give you the confidence? Did your co-founder coming in into the business change change your perspective? How did those things come about, and why yeah. get into real estate? So it's it's interesting. So. One of the things, you know, when I kind of failed, in my eighth semester, whatever business I was doing, I failed, I lost money. Uh, one of the ways I kind of got back was that, hey, let me get back to like, you know, get into like a job. But eventually, I'll, you know, for me, it was like, I owe it to myself to come back to entrepreneurship. Like, and I want to prove it. So you didn't want to work for anybody. Like That know, was a thought already. I thought that, you know, being entrepreneur is the thing. But I knew that I didn't have the resources. I ran out of money. I borrowed money also. I ran out. Technically, I'd become negative. So I had to. So one is I decided I'll come back. Like back in 2003 itself. And then when I started working in US, earned money, I feel key, I have a character where somewhere, you know, I, I think I get over things. I have the fascination for travel also reduced, fascination for kind of money. In that sense, see, while I still want money, I think my, I realize money is not the only thing for me. You know, I had BMW convertible, worked in Wall Street, lived in Manhattan, traveled to like Europe, like across US. Like I realized that it's a good know, thing to get over those things when you're younger. Yeah, I got over like so many different things, and I realized that is ultimately not what I want. Uh, to a point where I started almost getting depressed. Like you know, I started feeling at one point everything I wanted I got. Like now I'm done. Like you know, I think um, I almost like hit a mid crisis, midlife crisis much early. Like you know, early 30s itself, and then I, I think somewhere I kind of uh, had to really figure out why I'm not happy. You know, because working in Bloomberg, working in Wall Street, like I'm like, I'm doing everything that everybody wants, any kid wants to be here. And, but you know, you come here and it's actually not the place, you know. Absolutely. So, you and know? your parents must have been pretty confused because growing up in Mysore, I can relate to it because growing up in Karnataka, the aspiration was you study well, of course, you go to America, you made it. Absolutely. And they wouldn't want you to come back. Yes, yes. My right? mom was shocked that I was coming back. And that back. to come and start real estate. Yes, yes. You know, that must have shocked them so i want to know what is the what is the hypothesis why come and start here so there were various technicalities so one is i realized that uh, i have to become an entrepreneur and also i kind of had a realization that engineer see while i was in wall street i was still an engineer in the okay. sense i was a tech guy who used to work with the business people so i, I read a lot of finance and all that but still i was an engineer 
and I somehow f realized, had a very strong realization, which is actually absolutely true now, is that I was not meant to, see engineers a lot of times is an introvert job. You yeah. know, you know, the, you, you don't, you. But they're organized though, in their head. They're organized and you know, but for me, no, I think I need to meet, express, do things. I, I okay. think that's when I derive self-satisfaction. So I kind I of was it. in a wrong job for my personality. Okay. So entrepreneurship was the right job for my personality, right? Somewhere I kind of, I think it was a strong realization. Was there somebody who told you that you got to do uh, that? I, I think I, I kind of, yes, I think I was really, I had to kind of consult somebody, uh, Thora, but I was really kind of confused that why am I not happy? Like, you know, while I've done everything right, um, then I kind of somewhere realized because I'm doing something, I derive my satisfaction from career and I was in a wrong career. Like, you know, I, I'm yeah. sure, you know, you might have also seen that sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Um, right. So I think I had to make a strong choice that I want to become an entrepreneur. And I realized if I want to become an entrepreneur, I have to get back to India because having grown up in India, I understand Indians more than anybody else, right? Indians is what I've always grown up with. While I am fascinated about Americans, what they do, etc., I somewhere felt that I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of an outsider, right? Uh, you know, in India, somebody talks about Kapil Dev, I know what they're talking about. In US, somebody talks about some baseball star, something, I'll be like, what are they talking about, right? Uh, so I used to feel a little out of place. And I also knew that I'll do an entrepreneurship. See, it's not necessarily super high tech. I will do something which relates to people, makes a difference, where I can see the difference, etc. So that's why, and, and also, you know, US has this green card, all these issues. I knew that if I keep waiting, my life, like, you know, my life, I'm a very big follower of, uh, um, you know, Y Combinator uh, uh, and Y Combinator founder, etc. right? Uh, the Hackers and Painters uh, is one of the best books. Uh, I think one of the places he uh, clearly says, Paul Graham, is that the, you know, if you first time entrepreneur, you should do between the age of 24 to 36. He gives a number. I realize that I'm going to run out of it if I keep waiting for my green card, etc. So all these technicalities, I'm like, you know, I don't care. Yeah. Like, if I want to become where I live, what I, you know, it doesn't matter in that sense. Uh, you know, I, in the sense, uh, I kind of felt that freedom is more important. Got I'm it. an Indian. In India, I have every freedom. I came back. And also the other reason was coming back to India, whatever my savings looks much bigger. The dollar saving looks much bigger. So kind you of had that confidence backing you. Yes. But yes. did you ever realize the real estate industry would be the state <laughs> it is? I didn't come back for real estate, by the way. Correct. In fact, I had made money in real estate. To, to give you an interesting fact, when I was 24 year old, uh, even before I went to US, I bought a property in Mysore, which seven years later, appreciate. I sold it for four times. Uh, you know, so actually that was one of the saving and some of that money, by the way, I invested in Lead Squared. Uh, I was the first round investor in Lead Squared, which is today a unicorn. So I kind of did various things. You know, I exited at the right time, uh, the real estate and invested in startup at the right time. So a couple of things went well for me. And, uh, and I was also inspired by Lead Squared guys, like, you know, ah. because of the founders, what they're doing. And I used to look up to them to think, uh, you know what, that's how I should do it. I modeled a lot of things like... How did you get to even the lead squared guys at that time? Were you <laughs> I, in the network? You were not uh, even in the network at the time. I like many not. of us, we were new in 2014-15, the startup ecosystem yeah. was so nascent. Yeah. Flipkart and Snapdeal had just been declared unicorns. And that's yeah. when all these things... That, uh, did, did you that's what, that's what is very interesting, okay. See, in my 90s, I'll tell you how it ultimately happened. It, I think it goes back to 1990s when Times of India used to have a page called Silicon Bytes. Like, so I started reading newspaper from the backside of sports. So <laughs> after all, sports, it was <laughs> sports, crime or sports business uh, and crime. So uh, if you read newspaper from back, uh, like Times of India, after sports, it was Silicon Bytes. Correct. So I started getting fascinated about startups. It was all about 90s was all about startups. So I don't think I don't know if Times of India has it now that section. So I knew about startups in before I joined engineering. In fact, most of my classmates, despite it being an ITK, they didn't know so much about startups. I was always fascinated about startups because I used to read a lot they in used 90s. They used to call it SME then. Uh, possibly different, but in US they used to call it startups. I used to read about Amazon even in 90s. So I, my first job was Infosys. I was like, I want to go to start. Nobody would do that at that time. I just quit Infosys and went and joined a startup called Proteons. By the way, that was the previous startup of the Lead Squared founders. So I was ah, there. So you knew them. So I was actually worked with them in a startup. Uh, so back in 2005, nobody would do that. I think I joined <laughs> them in 2004. By the way, I joined them. Like everybody was shocked. Why are you putting Infosys? It's interesting how things come together. Yeah. I, I, I think nobody would have predicted what's happened in the ecosystem. So why co-working, uh, Sesh? I'm, I'm fascinated because I saw a bloodbath in it, but you've stuck on and you've succeeded also in many ways. We'll get into why alternative investments, you've gone to that model, which is democratizing real estate for uh, retail investors, right? Which is fascinating, which is like a mutual fund 
any HNI can participate, anybody yes, can yes, participate absolutely. in that. Yes. We'll get into that. Talk about the co-working space. Was it hard at the time? How, you were 17 centers in Bangalore alone. I also have a pet peeve. Why haven't you expanded across India? Although you've got the best, you know, real estate and business districts in Bangalore. Why didn't you scale it up across? Talk about the genesis of the idea. Sure. Um, so to put it in short, right, when I came back, didn't come back to do co-working as okay. such. Um, you know, one of the things was I kind of did a bit of startup thing in US before I came back. I, I kind of, I was in Bloomberg. I felt that first let me go to a startup in US, uh, experience it a bit, then I do my own company. So I became a CTO for a startup in US. My last stint there um, was no, as a technically kind of a non-Wall Street stint, um, which was a CTO of a startup. And that time I experienced this, the co-working world in New York. New York had already taken off in the co-working thing. Absolutely. So I had such a fascinating time like visiting co-working spaces, I could meet entrepreneurs. And for me, you know, I felt like, you know, in a, when I was in corporate, I was like in Did a Did you zoo, visit the early right? WeWork there? Yes, <laughs> by the way, you believe it or not, I, I worked out of the first WeWork, etc. WeWork was like much smaller. And uh, the WeWork's headquarters, by the way, was, in, was literally, they were in Fulton Street. Uh, I was in Park Row. And it was actually next building. My house and WeWork headquarters were next buildings, literally next building. I just had to cross the road. So uh, I kind of knew a lot of, so there are a lot of, uh, I was fascinated with WeWork at that time. I never thought I'll open something similar. I was fascinated with other co-working spaces also in the ecosystem. I felt like I'm part of an ecosystem, right? After leaving corporate, I was very scared leaving. See, when you have a corporate job, you're a little bit scared to leave it, right? Yeah. Uh, so I was a little scared, but then I felt because of co-working ecosystem, I felt like I'm part of something big. Right, I could meet founders, etc. Right. Then when I came to India, because there was no co-working spaces here, it's suddenly like the only thing you have is like your story or something to read. I'm like I could Absolutely. have read it in New York also. Like I could, I was not able to meet any founders, nothing. I don't know who is where is people located, so much traffic. Like I felt suddenly like I've gone backwards, you know, because you know because you have to find some room somewhere to work. Like you know, some business centers were there that whole ecosystem feeling was completely missing. And now it really felt like, was like, am I doing something wrong? You know, I think, see, we are all like humans, right? Why do we, you go to college, if you're part of an institution, yeah, you feel good. Yeah, we're part good. of a network. Huh. So when you have people around you who are doing stuff, you talk to them, it feels like, you know, because startup is a tough game, right? I mean, yeah. you're taking a lot of risk, but you'd rather be with people around you who are encouraging you, et cetera, right? Um, so I think there were, it was missing point, and I was trying to do tech stuff, somehow it was not taking off. I thought, why don't I start, and I was, honestly speaking, you know, the way it worked was, I thought I'll start one co-working space and I'll have my tech company inside that, and I, I will have a <laughs> so startup. So you thought you'll have a network? I will build my own. your own startup in that network. Yeah, I thought, let me create my own. Honestly, I never thought I'll open many co-working space. I thought, I'll create one where there'll be a lot of amazing startups, they'll become friendship. See, I'm a social person. I'm a bit of an extrovert Got social it. person. So I started, it was like a, my own fantasy, star, like a co-working for myself. <laughs> Absolutely. But that became big somehow. <laughs> Where was your first center? It was in Korumangla, right behind the police station. It was a huge villa that we took, like 100 seater, and it had like and five you hit six. Big. Straight away, take a 100 seater and make it work. Yeah, yeah. So, did you ever think it'll scale this big? In five so, I years? started one. I think what happened is once I started, it took off so well that I forgot the fact that I'm a tech guy or anything. For me, entrepreneurs are coming, people are recognizing me. And I felt like I'm doing something like, you know, you know, suddenly like there's so many entrepreneurs and everybody's like, it's like, you know, I'm the one who's running it, right? So I'm like the top of the pyramid there. And I somehow got that kick and I also felt the satisfaction because I am giving a space for startups they otherwise didn't have. I've met people who told I found my co-founder in Beehive. I found like, you know, I, I, honestly, people have found a spouse also there and all, all those <laughs> that has happened. So I think somewhere it felt like I'm doing something impactful. So then, then I was I was super fast. Honestly, like um, you know, November 14, uh, you know, 2014 November, I started the first one in Kormangla. Yeah. December I started in Ranagar. January I started HSR layout. Trust me, to, even today these three are the most important micro markets. And I figured it. I had just come back from US. Honestly, I didn't know exactly. Somehow I figured the right places. Somehow I think I had the right gut. I will talk to people and figure what they want. And and it just took off. And you know, Bloom Ventures invested. Even like you know, people like Raghunandan, uh, uh, Taxi, Taxi for sure, for sure. Uh, you know, Razorpay, both the founders invested. So somewhere what happened, no, I think sometimes when I build, by the way, the main thing was I put like a lot of my money. Like the quality is that, you know, you, you do it with such passion, but then suddenly there was this, you know, enormous number of people who started co-working. 
Yeah, by was, the way, I was the first one. Funny. It's very funny that yeah. all the big Everybody brands came about. Yeah. You know, started, we, yeah. we know the WeWorks, Coworks came about. Then we know what happened. That was sort of a difficult period when there's everybody was saying I'm a co-working company. Yeah, yeah, I think. But, but then yeah. you didn't, I want your view on that when that, you know, there was oh, what, 300 co-working centers came up in India or something. Absolutely. And then again, everything closed down. <laughs> yeah. You, your view on that? I think I went through, personally also, kind of, it was a journey which is a little tough for us also because what happened when we were the first co-working, first organized player, let's put it that way, that had the right format uh, in Bangalore. All the best of the best people were there in a villa with me, Agreed. like my customers, right? I, I trust me, even today, n nobody, not even me, can create that group today because nothing else was there. Just imagine you are you are a town with the only coffee shop, yeah, got it. and all the best people are coming, all the intellectuals yeah. are coming. Reminds right? me of the early coffee day. You're right; <laughs> they were the early movers, and hence the brand value continues even to this day. Actually. Yeah. So that happened and amazing people used to come in Mercedes and all and like, you know, today those are, some of them are in like, they, 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 they didn't come because of shortage of money, they're like, this is some fascinating place. So what happened is when everybody kind of came, somewhere I think my, the quality diluted. Completely. And, and I realized it is not the interiors, etc. It is the quality of people I can bring that makes the place, right? So you talk about yeah. NITK, it is not the building, it is the people, <laughs> right? It's the institution, right? You're so absolutely anyway. right. Somewhere co-working is about the quality of people. It's not just about the real estate for you. Yeah. So, so I think somewhere, I think uh, our quality, because I think because there was so much money being thrown, I think we went to tough times. And I also had a personal identity crisis. What are we? Like, you know, first it was about, hey, we are the co-working space. Now, somewhere I realized now that industry is becoming, you know, it was a little scary. Like, you know, then people didn't want to invest in the sector. See, first people didn't want to invest because WeWork is coming to India is going to become yeah. very big. And then they know how like, that story played out. Yeah. <laughs> and later they're like, hey, WeWorks is going through some difficulty. That's why I don't want to invest. I'm like, either case, it's become tough. Uh, so I think investments became tough. So I think we definitely went through tough, tough times. I think, honestly, I think what I'm proud is, I think 99% people would have given up, like in my yeah. situation. I think the only thing I, I think I did right was I didn't give up. Um, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that we are success today or see, we are kind, somehow we're like still making it. But I think at least we refuse to die. So that was the bigger thing. So I think that's the... Now the transformation, which is very key to me, the last two years you transformed, you completely flipped the script. You said, mm -hmm. I'm, yes, I'm a co-working space, but why not you guys as individual investors, people like me and other common people, h and is also, can invest in real estate, take fractional ownership of a property. It gives you better return than an FD, better return than gold, Absolutely. you know? and. That is essential for the real estate community. I'll tell you why it's important because last 10 years, real estate also has not given mu much of return. But these type of properties can because you know, India is young, India, a lot of, I mean, we are predicting about 200,000 startups by the end of 2030 or more, right? Yeah, yeah. And you seem to have read it early. How did, how did that sudden shift happen on democratizing real estate ownership where you don't have to go to regular investors and raise money, but you can raise it from people like mm -hmm. H&I's and give them fractional ownership? You have to give me the history of that. I've covered retail and you have to differentiate why it's not a strata sale that you're doing. You're doing it strategically. You're doing it more from a brand perspective. There is a definite IRR. There's a definite return. If you're an investor, you get all the data at, you, at, your, at your doorstep in the app perhaps, right? You want to explain that transformation? Yes, yes. So that was, um, yeah, I think so one of the things definitely has been, I think about a lot of entrepreneurs is um, we should have the ability to spot the trend a bit early. Uh, I think that is something I think I've consistently... Otherwise you'd have died. Otherwise, huh. I, I personally believe co-working is a downside at that time and they would have left you in the lurch. People would have. Yeah. And, and you know how investments are. People will just say it's not scalable. And that would yeah. have left you bad. And you yeah. transform quickly and the next thing I know, you know, there's news talking about this Beehive Fund. Yeah. You know, talk about that, please. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I think the way it was born was because, um, you know, we refused to die. We had to find a way to survive. Right, because money was, um, I, I realized that cracking institution money had become a little tough for me. Uh, one is because co-working was no longer the trend for people yeah. to kind of invest. And also if you see today the ones in co-working that have become bigger are either like backed by business family slow, they already have a big business, some other business. Yeah, they have legacy. So they have a legacy, so they have balance sheet and they know how to pull in money. 
um, uh, I think mostly those are the ones who kind of became uh, bigger rather than like a startup like somebody like a, who doesn't come from business background and building not many uh, I don't think uh, could really scale this business as such right so so I had to find a different way so now for me you know survival was one and then the growth right you're surviving so that you can grow now uh, it became a necessity for me to figure out money so I knew that I can I have the brand I know how to run the co-working space I know how to make the money what I don't have is the money right and because it's a capex driven business it's not a SaaS or something that can just kind of scale right uh, by itself because every property needs money so I kind of went to New York I traveled back to US I met people multiple meetings you know private equity you met everybody fund. the whole hog uh -huh, I kind of did all that see I couldn't I, while I couldn't crack the money everybody will give some interesting insights somebody would say hey you should have something in, you should also have ownership in real estate somebody else should say unless you're ready to take 50 or 100 million dollars you can't talk to us like you know and then finally I realized how, where do I crack this money right ultimately and somewhere I'm like hey um, you know what um, you know what a uh, lot of my you know, look at my cousin look at my friends they all have money and and those guys are keeping money in FD like literally for nothing I, I know people in US who are kept money in checking account which is technically zero zero percent right um, and I'm like you know uh, like you know a lot of my friends who have more than hundred thousand dollars in a zero percent checking account <laughs> right and I'm like you know because they're so busy just so dead money yeah and uh, it's not you know, growing yes it's not growing and they don't know where to invest and and i realized that a lot of people i think a lot of my friends kind of admire me because you know in eight semester doing uh, business and now also i quit job a lot of people know the, in their heart they want to do it but uh, they feel like i'm the representation they kind of yeah. look at me as an alter ego he quit and did something so people should always call and talk to me i realize and these guys were very much like you know what so they're successful guys they had the money they had money they are like in wall street they are like a lot of my us friends etc they kind of admire me and they wanted to support me so somewhere i could sense that they want to support me and what i did was i felt that you know what these guys have money i i'm, I'm confident i'll generate returns why don't i get from these guys only and then my mg road center right which is a super successful center which was launched in 2019 um, that was the first one where i kind of developed an investor model where I asked some of my friends to invest. Also, my wife also invested a little bit uh, uh, in that sense. So, some of these people with money, I told them I wanted to invest. And people invested. And you know what? I was always giving returns, including during pandemic, I gave returns. I re and somewhere I realized that I'm solving two problems, right? One is there's a business, we have workspace that needs money. They know they can do well. They're not able to crack institutions. Um, other side, there are people who are just keeping money in FD, etc. and all that. And, and honestly, that money is probably being stolen somewhere else, right? FD yeah. money is being Correct. used, it's is else. being misused also yeah. many times. Absolutely. All the scams that you see of banks, <laughs> like, you know, why is the difference so high that, that we get very less, the interest is very high, is because in between people are eating that money. So somewhere I'm not, so I'm like, you know, why don't I convince them to directly put here? So I think I kind of, because of necessity, I did it. And because of the fact that I succeeded in it, I realized that this is a much bigger thing. You know, investment, individual investors have money, they don't know where to invest. That was my theory. And somebody like me, who's in the market, I know where to invest. Yeah. Like, you know, somebody like my cousin who's in Apple, he doesn't, he kind of has less access, right? Like he's yeah. in a corporate, like my friends who are in banks in US, etc. And they are all like, Shesh, they all believe that I know it. Shesh, you know where to invest, tell me where to invest, right? So, uh, because I had a background where I was on the other side, I was a corporate employer. I also had money. I didn't know where to kind of put, right? Uh, it was not easy. So I kind of merged these together. Later, I said, it doesn't have to be just VA workers. Why don't we invest in commercial real estate? Why don't we do international real yeah. estate? Why don't we do income generating? So I kind of, I think it became a separate company. It is a separate thought it's process. Called the Beehive Fund. Uh, Beehive Fund, we are now, we're calling it Beehive Alts now because we also got a nice CB approval for a fund. So it was getting a little confusing. So we have got a 400 crore fund uh, also, by the way, alternate investment okay. fund. So we are calling it's it Beehive Category two. Huh? Yeah. AIF Cat it's 2. It's AIF Cat 2. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. So the model, you have to differentiate. It's different from a REIT. It is different yes. from a strata sale. So if people watching this and come and put in money, there is a actual buy-in and you have to explain the model. So yes, uh, I think conceptually, it, see concept wise, it uh, objective is similar to REIT, objective at least. Uh, what is the REIT objective is that there are real estate opportunities out there. There are individual investors, they kind of just buying. Uh, they don't have to go and do all the work of a, you know investment, etc. There's a professional team behind. I'm talking about REIT that is making that investment eventually gets the returns, right? So conceptually, it is same what we are doing. Now, 
the difference here is that we are private market um, and um, essentially there are deals out there which people like me because of my experience right I'm doing this from 2014 now and before that also I was in Wall Street so yeah, a lot absolutely. of my life experience for whatever reasons has put me in a place where I have access to deals I know people people trust me I've always delivered landlords know me so now I'm in such a nice place uh, for while it's kind of coincidental whatever it is I'm in a good place honestly I know that right I know where to put money and uh, so I kind of have transformed into a fund kind of a model right now yeah. obviously I know which are the right places but it's, I don't have personal so much money to put that's why there are fund managers right yeah they will uh, manage other people's money absolutely so that's basically the same logic applied to it's this absolutely same logic you have SPVs okay we clearly say this is the deal I found hey there's a deal in Koromangla going on right now tomorrow then I may have a deal in Whitefield uh, etc so I will create an uh, in, you know complete details huge deck that explains to people and it's a deal by deal opportunity so I kind of have I investors it. I explain them you want to invest here if you want to invest yeah. put money in uh, partner me for the deal you kind of there is kind of a legal structure where they invest money I do the deal I give them the returns so I'm like a fund manager if they make money I make money and, and the slab system would be depending on my investment mm -hmm. the square feet uh, it's a certain amount of square feet apportioned to me yes and no um, I would I what I would typically do is I will I will kind of in my documents will indicate this percentage of the whole property is yours okay I may not necessarily so the square feet model people used to have undivided shares yeah, model absolutely. and all that where exact square in the feet, old days that was uh, it, yes. old days that was there so so a kind of a fractional investment model has existed in a different format before okay right see Bangalore the Vaisha community in Bangalore as always have been done doing it. it like you know when I met them they're like we're doing it from three decades right it's just that I think the old model that the technical difference was that it was leading to too many decision makers which has led to a lot of properties becoming a failure yeah, and legal problems a lot of legal yeah. because there are too many khatas too many decision makers one fellow will offer one rate another fellow will offer one rate how many people will I negotiate right so now this is now it is now what we're doing is a corporatization of that what happens in a corporate right you see let's say you own reliance industry shares yeah you can't tell Mukesh Ambani what to do right <laughs> he will do what needs to be done uh, right so so that's the whole thing right so basically if somebody owns a stake in my property you know I, st I they can't tell me what to do I know what is right yeah. I will do it and I'm aligned with them because I'm like a fund manager I have to deliver right I'm like that's what a Blackstone does right Blackstone does deals at a bigger scale hmm. for sovereign funds uh, okay. pension funds etc and they know what to do so why are sovereign fund pension funds putting money in Blackstone so whatever a Blackstone is doing at a very big level we are doing it for individual investors. So the IRR can be around 20, 30 uh, percent. We have different uh, kind of for products. Five years. Is it a five-year, eight-year lock-in? Uh, so we have uh, different kind of products at this stage. Uh, actual, commercial real estate ownership itself is technically lifetime, unless yes. I would decide to sell. Some of the properties are what we are doing is something that we may never sell. Yeah. So there is technically I tell people like your kids can also inherit this like eventually so like a perpetual state. license it, uh, yeah it's like that's because it's a ownership <laughs> so because there is a structure perpetual that perpetual ownership is a better yeah, way yeah it's it's a lifetime ownership and they should be getting income throughout lifetime that is one part of it uh, that's yeah. the actual commercial real estate uh, unless we exit we get a great deal of somebody buy out we may sell and like give them like profit now that's one part right the second is we also have business financing so hmm. there are businesses that we identify where investment can be done uh, for example, there is a pub that is coming up very interestingly. Mm. So there is huge number of demand. So we are kind of a model where, uh, see this model existed. I think somewhere we were chatting, you said yes. one of your cousin has invested yes. in a pub. So what has happened is Bangalore, this model has existed. A lot of pubs are funded by multiple people, but they are being funded at crores. They are not taking a smaller ticket size. Your, your cousin so that's might the have democratization been, thing that you are uh, talking so about. So people have been raising 2-2 two, two crores from 6-7 people to start a yeah, pub. That's how the model was we were talking yes, about. Yes, the yeah. same model I brought it down to 10-10 lakhs model. And the individual investor like normal guy did not know about, see your, your cousin is wealthy so he knew about opportunity. <laughs> Certainly he is a wealthy guy. Uh -huh. yeah. A normal guy who, who still have money 10-20 lakhs to spare, they don't even know this. I am extending it to them. That's what this I'm is very interesting, sir. But I don't have to be locked in. So what if I say I, the buy in is ten, I'll put in ten, but I want to exit in five years. I want to pay for my daughter's marriage, my son's marriage, my son's education, absolutely. my daughter's education. That is possible. That is absolutely possible. It's easier to do on our platform than you, you know individuals buying re regular real estate. It's tougher to sell regular real estate. Okay. And the downside. I want you to uh, talk about the downside. Uh, have you thought about the downsides to it, and how do you want to handle it? See the downside says yes. See any investment is um, always subject to risk, right? There's, yeah. no, there's nothing called risk-free. 
I tell people you keep cash cap, you know, that's cash is like depreciating every day, every second. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you keep it under it's your better than that. bed. That's also can yeah. be stolen, whatever yeah. can happen. There are risks everywhere. So there's nothing called zero risk in life. Uh, real estate is one of the safest, right? Okay. Relatively speaking. Uh, in fact, um, Warren Buffett has himself said, in times like these when there's high inflation, yeah. real estate is a better asset class. That's because cost of replacement of real estate, when there's inflation, cost of replacement becomes higher. So real estate actually does better in inflation as well. It's interesting for me that the RBI puts out reports saying 77 to 84% of Indians love investing in real estate. Yes, they own yes. some form of real estate. Yes. But you're saying, this is a better way of investing in real estate than getting locked into one property, which Absolutely. is an apartment, by the way, for 30 years, 15 yes, years, yes, right? Yes. That's, that's what you'd advise. Yes, yes. I think the simplest way I tell people is, you want to be in real estate as an investor, not as a landlord. Yeah. There's a difference, Absolutely. right? Nobody is there. You know, do you want to get a call in the middle of the night that a bathroom is leaking? From Your tenant calls you at 11. <laughs> that, you know, nobody wants that, right? I'm like, I didn't get in, get in for that. <laughs> like, got they it. got in for, you know. I got for, it. Okay, that's about the business. Uh, I wish you all the best in that and I hope Thanks. it goes really well for you. It's early days, but I definitely know India is rising, income is going up. So I hope that uh, people end up owning real estate in a better way and probably churn mm. it and make money and you know, mm. change their lives. You are also a startup enabler. You're very well known in the ecosystem today. Yeah. You're, you mentioned that you're an extrovert and you like helping people. Uh, that's one thing that uh, you know, a lot of the founders keep telling me. Why did you develop that side of you? You could just be a founder who doesn't care. Why are you helping many founders today? So um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, see, uh, one thing I think for me it has always been, I think one of my realization was, um, I think when I should try to understand what do they want in life, right? Always known, I think money is important, but I think I've known that money is not the number one thing for me. Uh, I think, see, money should be there because, see, without money, uh, otherwise, I would have started an NGO. So I'm not an NGO guy in that sense, right? Money is important, but I think for me, the strong relation, money is not the number one. For me, the satisfaction of what I do, right? And I would want to see people, I want to see an impact. Impact is more important than money. Let's put it that way, right? For me. Um, so for me, I, I love entrepreneurship. I love entrepreneurs. Uh, I feel entrepreneurs are always up against, they're always odds. fighting the odds, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so I like to support them. And I think I got lucky with the fact that I started a business where my customers are startups. It's like, I don't know, it's just a coincidence. And, and, and I see them all around. I definitely feel for them and I, I feel a sense of satisfaction if they Many do well. Them, yeah. uh, right, so I've always kind of, uh, and I've built my brand like that. That Got way it. we uh, help startups, Got it. you know. You, finding a co-founder, was it very important to have a co-founder? Uh, name your co-founder and why, why is it important to work in pairs rather than, rather than alone? Uh, that's interesting. So I think uh, one is, of course, I think, uh, um, again, uh, goes back to, um, you know, before starting again, because I read, I read a lot uh, also. I did a lot of research and I think for me, I realized Paul Graham was the most inspirational. Because he's the founder of Y Combinator, yeah. right? The super yeah. successful accelerator. Um, so he also kind of always, in, they always say, ki, you know, they always like companies with two or three co-founders, like yes. rather than one. I agree. So I kind of, a lot of times I went by that, that is important. And I think it can also balance um, one person, right? You know, sometimes individuals can kind of um, go out of hand in that sense, right? So somebody should be there to tell you. Um, see, uh, you know, I think uh, once you have done many companies, you can be a sole co-founder possibly, sole founder in that sense. But I think I had not done many companies as such. It was always good to have balance. Uh, and I've had some, uh, you know, so I mean, historically, see, we are eight years old now. So we have had, um, you know, co-founder, you know, I mean, while they're in good relationship, they're not fully like with us at this stage, some okay. of them. See, Monopa is there. In FinTech, it's me, Monopa, and Sandeep Gupta. Workspace, okay. it's been me and Monopa. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think they bring different skills and they bring strength to the company. And I think it's important to have more people who feel ownership. Uh, and, um, and I think a lot of times, I think uh, many times, it's, I would say like Monopa compliments me. Sometimes I can be very aggressive. You know, uh, you know, and some lot of employees would probably like he is kind of the good guy. You know, uh, so uh, there are a lot of complementary skills, and he's a lot more balanced. Um, you know, and sometimes he would kind of say, "Are you really like? Is that right? What you're doing?" Whereas somebody else might have an employee might have never asked me those questions. Like you know, he would ask it. me questions. Yeah. Um, I, I think it has brought in the balance, um, and there is a strong ownership, and also right. See, Monopa is there. Uh, technically speaking, he was not there on day one. He came slightly later because I realized I need somebody, like maybe like after a year. 
that came in 2015. Um, but you imagine now it's 2022, it's still there, right? Yeah. Uh, right, see, uh, more or less like very few employees who were there in 2015 are there with me, right? So that consistency, that memory, like I can talk to Monopa, something that happened in 2016, he'll remember. I have nobody else to talk about that, you know, in that sense, right? So, uh, and a lot of context is there, and I think that sense of balance. Leechcode also, by the way, I think one of the reasons I invested is because the same co-founders were starting this. You know, I worked in Proteons in 2004, I invested in their next company in 2012, when the same three three people were running, like, you know. You told me. Uh, yeah. yeah, there were four in Proteons, one of them went to do something else, because he went to higher studies, three of them were doing. So, co-founders kind of sticking on all that is kind of very stability, it's being stability. Got it. My last two questions to you, 15 years, 20 years ago, a boy from Mysore, managing 100 crores of AUM, raising money from VCs, would you ever thought about it? <laughs> Would your parents have thought about it? They still don't understand what you do. I hope with this video they get to know what you do. Yeah, yeah. Your thoughts. You ever yeah. thought this would happen? Uh, I do. I don't think uh, I would have thought that far. Um, in AUM, you know, like I said, right? We started the fintech sales started last October. This October we are set to hit 100 crores of AUM, which is assets under management. I would have kind of um, never imagined, you know. So. Uh, I just want to get into entrepreneurship. I think I follow my heart to an extent, and I think one of what is my strength is I think I'm I'm a very good problem solver. So a lot of it has been I've never modeled it like anybody else, right? <laughs> While I read a lot of biographies, etc., of a lot of uh, founders, uh, I think every time it has been problem solving. Hey, you know what? MG Road, I needed more money, beautiful property. And, and you know, others said, you know, I'm trying to think how to solve it. There are people with money who are generally calling me, uh, you know, who are my friends. I'm like, hey, I kind of did that. And then pandemic came, uh, you know, nobody would have predicted and gave me a lot of time. And then Sandeep Gupta was also discussing with me, Fraction will become big. And I'm like, hey, I've done something similar already. I've raised money from people. So then we started something else. Then Sandeep is like, AF, Lekiana, because it will give us strength to write single checks. So everything has been like honestly problem solving. I don't think, a lot of times I tell people, you know, very hard, like we may always have five years vision, et cetera. You know, beyond a quarter, it's quite hard to think actually. Absolutely, that's a well said, <laughs> well said statement. I think as founders, you're only looking at the quarter, although we have a long-term vision. Grin and bear, or you're a guy who says, I'll be aggressive, I'll take the problems head on. I, I, I'm, I'm an aggressive guy, you know, so I, don't, I may not look, uh, being a South Indian, <laughs> I may not look at, <laughs> and South Karnataka <laughs> especially. Especially uh, from Mysore, Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but I do have, maybe my father is from North Karnataka, so maybe I have some blood of that. Um, so, they are more aggressive. Um, and you have an Naidu blood too, which yes, is a yes, business. Yes, my grandmother, kind of yes, yeah, yeah. My <laughs> grandmother uh, uh, comes from a, a business uh, background actually. Um, so, basically I do, I think I'm kind of a very interesting mix that way. Um, and I think I am definitely a problem solver. I am aggressive. Nice. Um, I nice. like to take, I, I, I like to be in control, you know, in that sense. In the sense, uh, when I say I like to be in control, at least I hate, I hate it most when I feel I have lost control. Got it. I got you it. Know? My last question. I know you've said Paul Graham many times. We're not going to talk Paul Graham now. What were some of your influences in your life apart from these startup biographies? What influence? It can be books, music, movies. Um, I would say, like I say, I think, um, I think definitely, um, like I said, some of the inspirational people were, when I was in high school, um, you know, I used to hear a lot about uh, Narayan Murthy, uh, yeah. Sudha Murthy, yeah. etc. I would agree. Uh, agree. But Narayan Murthy is from Mysore. Yes, he uh, is. In fact, um, uh, I think we have, we have common school also, uh, Sharda Vilas. Uh, his father used to be teacher there as well. I also studied there for three years, uh, two years. Uh, so there were, so I could relate to, right? Narayan Murthy is from Mysore, so you can relate. Like, you know, if he can make it, like, you know, somebody from Mysore. So that's how you relate, right? Um, yeah, I got it. Uh, so, and also because my cousin also, who's like nine years older than me, studied in Suratkal in computers. Um, and he had joined Infosys. So it was an inspiration. We knew about it and all that. So Narayan Murthy kind of was an influence for me. Yeah. That somebody coming from Mysore and his like father was also education background. And then Dhirubhai Amani was an absolute inspiration. Like, you know, he could like do anything, right? He's like a star. Uh, so, and then I used to read a lot about Silicon Valley. So. I think mostly, I think these were influence for me. Yeah. I think I'm most inspired by really successful people and real things. Even when I watch TV series, right, I actually like to watch real, uh, you know, right now uh, I'm watching Dropout, um, you know, uh, so which is about Theranos, uh, which is very interesting for me. And even the WeWork, uh, we crashed, yeah. I watched. 
So I kind of like to always see something real and what happened and all that and, and they kind of inspire me. So you're you not know? the kind of guy who's going to look back and say that, look, uh, something's happened in the past. You don't look back, you only look forward and want to go for it all uh, the time. Yes, I think I very rarely look back to the past. Okay, you know? last question. Guide to happiness, quickly and we'll close. Guide to happiness is, um, I think, see, people say follow your heart in that sense. So what I would say is, I think one is people should know what is important for them. I think that's one of the exercises I did. What is important? What matters to them, right? Uh, they should have that self-awareness is very, very important. Like, for example, for somebody whom money does matter, cannot go and do an NGO and later, obviously, they'll be not happy, right, um, in that sense. And uh, somebody who wants to do an impact cannot be just purely working on a corporate job they don't like just to make money. Right, so I think people should know what they like and should have the courage to kind of take it up. Otherwise, it's like you're hating yourself, right? I mean, well said. Uh, you know, uh, so and, and, and my own thing is you should be doing something where when you wake up in the day, you're looking forward to it. You shouldn't be Got like, it. I don't want to wake up. That's like the worst thing to happen, right? I mean, uh, so that's what I feel is. Yeah, so that's the message. Wake up and go get what you want. Don't look back. <laughs> And don't go back to bed. <laughs> That's really well said. This yes. has been a pleasure. Thank you for being on the upstreamlife.com station. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I think it's been amazing. I think this has been like a, I was telling her, this is almost like a, you know, conversation over a beer uh, types. And, um, you know, I, I've enjoyed this. And we'll do the beer too. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, we'll do that. At, at uh, you know, we are starting a pub in one of the new I'll beers. I'll see you at the new we'll pub for sure. <laughs> Check out, uh, guys. Please check out uh, BI Vaults. Uh, that's the business. I'll put the website in the description. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Awesome.